All right, well, certainly thank you for those songs this evening. We're going to be going to Romans chapter 9. In our current series through Romans, this is message number 41, entitled, A Problem Like Israel. And we'll be looking at Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Paul began the letter to the Romans by expressing his desire to visit Rome in order to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome. That's chapter 1 and verse 15. The Roman letter proceeds in a very linear fashion as Paul opens up the gospel and its implications from that point. And what I mean by linear fashion is that Paul moves uh, point to point to point to point through a progression. Uh, it's, it's all um, connected. Chapters 1 to 4 argue that the entire human race is guilty of missing the mark of God's glory and sinning, such that God is righteous and just in His impartial condemnation and wrath and judgment of all people. The only escape or salvation from God's just wrath is being justified by faith in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ for sins and having our deficit of righteousness erased by the crediting of Christ's perfect righteousness to our account by faith. And then we have chapters 5 to 8. And chapters 5 to 8 open a wide range of blessings for all those who are justified by faith, including peace and reconciliation with God, death to sin, death to the law, being joined to Christ, receiving the gift of the Spirit, adoption as God's sons, and future inheritance of glory with Jesus Christ. Our hope is eternally secure because full salvation is entirely in God's hands to fulfill. And the various experiences that we have in this present life are working together to fulfill God's purpose for all His children to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And Paul reached a, a climactic pitch um, in the last paragraph of chapter 8, as he showed that there is none who can condemn those whom God has justified on the grounds of Christ's death. And he also showed how there are none who can separate God's children from God's love and their full inheritance in Jesus Christ. Now if we stop at that point, it feels like we have a lovely resolution as Paul began in Romans 1 and ends in Romans 8. Paul has presented what could be described as a tightly structured argument that explains the gospel thoroughly and concludes on a very high point of praise. And it almost feels like that the letter to the Romans could end quite satisfactorily right there at the end of chapter 8. Of course, we're only roughly halfway through the letter, so he's obviously not finished. And we might expect then 
to find the practical application, the useful instructions for living life and navigating different issues that we find ourselves entangled in. And quite often um, in Paul's letters, we have about half of it that has a theological instruction and about half of it that follows with a practical application. And so that's very normal um, to expect. And Paul does give us that in Romans, but that part of the letter doesn't start until chapter 12. So chapter 9 actually starts the next major section of this letter that goes through the end of chapter 11. Verses 1 to 5 in chapter 9 are the opening paragraph of this chapter, which introduced this entire section. And the opening paragraph of chapter 9 and the closing paragraph of chapter 8 could hardly be any more different in their mood than what they are. Chapter 8 ends with a, a, a soaring faith and, and praise of God and rejoicing in salvation and assurance. Chapter 9 opens with a solemn and a painful lament of a very personal nature for Paul. In other words, it's hard to imagine them being any more in contrast than what they are. Now chapter 9 clearly begins a new subject for Paul. Chapter 8 ends with a resolution for the setup that started in chapter number 5, suggesting obviously that Paul has finished that section. And as you start into chapter 9, there are no connecting words that have been so common um, throughout, showing that this is connected to what has come before. It's expanding on it. It's explaining it in some way connecting. But we don't have that at the beginning of chapter 9. The mood, the, the mood of the writing changes, as I mentioned a moment ago, but so does the form. You can see very clearly that Paul is writing differently when he begins into chapter 9 as from what he has been in chapter number 8. Now when we view chapters 9 to 11 in the big picture, the broadest view that we can take of these chapters, we see that they are about the reliability of God's promises. They are about the reliability of God's Word. His faithfulness to keep and fulfill all the promises that He has made. And these chapters deal with the reliability of God's promises, particularly in the case of Israel. Now, as soon as we see that, in other words, as soon as we see that big picture for chapters 9 to 11, that, uh, and as it's voiced from the beginning here pretty early on, verse number 6, not as though the Word of God has taken none effect. That's, that drives a, a theme um, for these chapters. And as soon as we see that these chapters are about the reliability of God's promises, then we can see that this section is not completely unconnected to what has come before. So it's not like when we get to Romans chapter 9, Paul just completely goes a different direction and, and chapters 1 to 8 is over and he's moving on. Paul has actually stressed through the first eight chapters of this letter, he has stressed justification by faith, apart from any and all works of the law, as the gracious gift of God. He has encouraged assurance on the basis of God's sovereign purposes to bring all His children to glorification. So in, in a word, we could say, Paul has made us totally dependent on God for salvation. And so it's not an unreasonable question. Is God... 100% unfailingly reliable. I mean, as we've read these first eight chapters, there could be no question that Paul is showing our total dependence on God for salvation. We can't merit it with our works. We can't do it through keeping the law. Um, we can't get there in any other way. We're totally dependent on God. So then, is God 100% unfailingly reliable? 
reliable. Now that might seem like an odd question to ask, but really it's not. And it's really at the heart of this issue that Paul is addressing in this next section. Can God's Word be trusted so completely that we can hang our entire eternal fate on His Word alone? Now, in these broad terms, we can obviously see the relevancy of this section. I mean, Paul has, in chapters 5 to 8, as Paul has given assurance of that hope of future glory, he has based it all on God and God's faithfulness in His Word, God's purposes, God's sovereign ability to fulfill and to keep and to work all things together for good, that, that His children all come to glorification and full inheritance. So we can see, obviously, again, a relevancy that this next section in Romans has for what Paul has been writing about. So we have to consider, when we think about the question of the reliability of God's promises, we have to consider another question in this section. And that is, why Israel? Why is Paul talking about Israel the way that he is in this section. He brings up Israel at this point in the letter and he goes on to speak extensively about Israel in these next couple of chapters. In chapters 9 to 11, we have the largest concentration of Old Testament references in the book of Romans. In this section, we have over about a fifth of the letter to the Romans in chapters 9 to 11. It's not a small part. It's not insignificant. But why? Why is Paul talking about Israel at this point? Well, on the one hand, Paul is answering a question or an objection that he has most likely heard before. He will make use of the fictitious questioner, which we've already seen before. He'll make use of that in this section, but he doesn't start this section by raising a question. Well, Paul had been preaching the gospel at this point for over 25 years, as best as we can tell. We know that Paul had engaged in many different places throughout the the known world at the time. He had engaged in vigorous vigorous debates and disputes with Old Testament experts about the compatibility of the gospel Paul preached with Israel as a people and the Jewish scriptures of the Old Testament. You'll also remember that Paul had also started his career on the other side of that argument. He was the one arguing against Christianity and the compatibility of the gospel of Jesus Christ with the Old Testament Scriptures. So Paul is very well experienced in the questions and the objections that were raised when he preached this gospel that he has been opening up and explaining through these first eight chapters. So Paul doesn't open with a question. But when you read this opening paragraph, it reads very much like an answer to a question. It reads very much that way. As Paul has already done, he is anticipating a question and he is answering it. Well, how does Romans 1 to 8 lead to the questions that this section in in Paul's letter answers? How do we get there? Is Paul just at this point, oh, and something else? Or is there a greater connection? Well, I believe there's a greater connection. Paul opens this letter by declaring, and this is chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. He opens this letter by declaring the gospel that he preached was promised beforehand by the prophets. In other words, the Old Testament Writers. So Paul opens this letter 
speaking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and stating openly that that is nothing other than what was promised beforehand in the Old Testament Scriptures. Again, viewed as the Jewish Scriptures. He proceeds in that opening of the letter to identify Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, He the one who was put to death outside Jerusalem. He identifies Jesus Christ not only as God's Son, but also as David's Son. Meaning that He is the Son of promise of the Old Testament Scriptures. He is the Messiah of Israel. He goes on in chapter 1 to state that the Gospel is first to the Jews. Chapter 1 and verse 16. In chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, Paul shows that the Jews are equally guilty and liable to God's wrath as the Gentiles are. In fact, judgment is also to the Jew first, according to the opening part of chapter 2. In the rest of chapter 2, Paul shows that justification does not come by the law, and that circumcision does not profit lawbreakers, which the Jews are. Chapter 3 opens by asking, well, what advantage then does the Jew have? And Paul argues they have many advantages. But Israel's faithlessness, he argues, does not nullify God's faithfulness. Jews and Greeks alike in chapter 3, he shows, have sinned, have fallen short of God's glory, and are alike vulnerable to God's wrath. And the latter part of chapter 3 shows that the righteousness of God is manifested apart from the law and is received only by faith. You come into chapter 4 where Paul teaches justification by faith and imputed righteousness using Abraham and David in the Old Testament as examples. And in chapters 5 to 8, show that we have to die to the law in order to be joined to Christ. And that only Christ can do what the law could never do. So in other words... This thread of Israel has been running throughout this letter. And actually, in many ways, Paul has sort of been rolling it back and rolling it back and rolling it back, and now he's going to deal with this because Israel does seem to pose a problem. And particularly, after Paul has so strongly set forth our total dependence on God's Word and His promises to fulfill those promises in order for the assurance of receiving our future inheritance. So what is the problem that Israel poses that is so important? Well, in the main, the Jews rejected the Gospel. They rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected the Messiah, the son of David, the promised seed of Abraham. They rejected Him. And they persecuted those who believed the Gospel, believed in Jesus Christ, and those who preached Jesus Christ. You remember in the early part of the book of Acts how that the apostles were were threatened at different times, stop preaching in this man's name. Stop preaching Jesus Christ. And of course, they would not. So this raises some questions. How can the Gospel fulfill the promises of God to Israel when they are mainly rejecting it? And even to this day. If Israel is cast off, how can Gentiles 
be assured of God's promises that they will see their full inheritance in the future. Does God's Word stand or fail? So I think we can see the problem then that we're facing. Does Israel provide us with an example of the failure of God's Word? This people that for all of these centuries and, uh, and, and millennia that God has called as His people, has given them all of these promises and, and all of these blessings, and yet they are cast off. Paul actually dropped some clues that he was heading toward this problem even in the end of chapter 8. So in chapter 8 and verses 31 to 34, that, those verses strongly echo the language of Isaiah chapter 50, verses 8 and 9. And in 836, Paul is giving a quotation from Psalm 44, verses 22. Now what is interesting is actually the connection between those two Old Testament passages. The common thread in both of those Old Testament texts, Isaiah chapter 50 and Psalm 44, the common thread in both of those texts is the lamenting of the state of Israel in exile, under judgment, and then also highlighting the faithfulness of God or the reliability of His Word in light of Israel's condition. Isaiah 50 is one of the servant songs in Isaiah's prophecy. And it is about the promised servant of Yahweh, which is a particular um, title for the Messiah in that section of Isaiah's prophecy. Chapter 50 contrasts the sins and the faithlessness of Israel with the faithfulness of the servant of Yahweh, the one who will be uncondemnable in His righteousness. And again, if you go back and read, particularly in verses 8 and 9, you'll see a, a strong echo of the language in chapter 8. Who, who is He that condemns? And, and, and so on. And by Isaiah chapter 53, it is clear that Israel's hope is in this servant. He's going to bear their sins and He's going to justify many by the end of Isaiah chapter 3. Psalm 44 also laments the condition of an unrestored Israel and the suffering of judgment that they are under. So that's a common thread in both of those passages. We have a quote of Psalm 44. We have a strong uh, linguistic connection between uh, this passage and Isaiah chapter 50. And both of them deal with the plight of Israel under judgment. So Paul moves into this section, beginning in Romans 9. Paul moves into this section as though this question, the problem of Israel, is the most natural question to arise. And again, he writes as if he's answering a question. No doubt this is precisely a question that he encountered a number of times. This question should really be more natural to us than what it is, but I fear that it, that it is not. And it's one reason why we wanted us to look so closely at why Paul begins to talk about Israel at this point in the letter. It should be more natural to us, but it seems that we have uh, really in so many churches such a lack of Old Testament exposition, such a lack of biblical theology that is tracing that true storyline of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation that, that, that we have in, in some ways have lost sight of what the Bible is telling us about God's purpose in the world and our place in that history. We can barely think of Israel uh, in many places unless it's some uh, just point of eschatology or some remote history. If the Old Testament is referenced at all, it's usually an illustration or 
somehow is magically transformed to be something about the church, which it is not. So again, this should be a very natural question for us to be concerned about. If Paul has based all of this assurance and all this hope of salvation on the promises of God, then what do we say about Israel and God's promises to them that we have clear record of in His Word? So we want to begin in this section in Romans 9. We want to take up this problem of of Israel. In verses 1 to 5 here, Paul begins this section with a confession. Verse 1, he writes, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. So Paul opens this section with a confession that is drawing attention to what he is about to say. And again, it reads like the answer to a question that has been raised, though the question is not stated. Again, I believe it's a question that naturally occurs. He affirms the truthfulness. He says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. He affirms the truthfulness of what he has to say as the truth in Christ and not a lie. Sort of giving a double confirmation from a positive and from the negative standpoint. And he also states that his conscience bears witness in this regard to the truth of what he is about to say. So when you look at it, his statement almost reads like the preface to a legal defense that Paul is about to give before some sort of a hearing. It reminds us, in fact, of Paul's defenses that he would make not long after writing this letter before the Sanhedrin and various Roman rulers in Acts Acts chapters 22 to 26. Reads very similar. In fact, at two different times before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem and before Felix in Caesarea, Paul also mentioned the fact of having a clear conscience before God. That that what he was preaching was the truth according to the Word of God. The conscience, of course, being that faculty that Paul wrote about in, in earlier in, in this letter in chapter 2 that either accuses or excuses us. In other words, a, a conscience is a, is a faculty that we have. It's a, it's a part of our immaterial being as um, human beings that have been um, uh, you know, created in the image of God, have been descended from Adam. That we have a conscience. We have something within us that has a view of right and wrong. And, and within us, it, it works to either confirm or to accuse us um, when we are doing something that our conscience believes to be wrong. Of course, the problem that we face um, as human beings is that our consciences have been defiled. They're not 100% reliable. They're not 100% effective. And our consciences have to be trained and have to be renewed according to Scripture. But in this case, that's exactly what Paul means. That his conscience has been shaped by the Word of God and he can in good conscience stand and proclaim this to be the truth. And that is what he is saying and what he testified before. If you remember his testimony before Agrippa, a part of that defense that he gave is that I have been preaching nothing other than Moses and the prophets said should come. Verse number 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Paul begins in verse 2 to speak of his pain. Great heaviness and ceaseless pain and, and ceaseless anguish, continuous sorrow, he says, in his heart. And here he, he is speaking the language of lament, very much in line with the laments of the Old Testament over the state of Israel. We've already seen a number of laments as we have been going 
through the Psalms. We also have laments in the writings of the prophets over the state of Israel. And we certainly have more laments to come in the Psalm. But what, what Paul is writing here reads like a lament from an Old Testament prophet over the state and the condition of Israel and the fact that they do not reflect the righteousness of their God. Verse 3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. His grief is caused by the state of Israel in rejecting the gospel and being accursed or cut off from Christ. I believe it was in Antioch in Pisidia when Paul spoke to those Jews there that that violently rejected and reacted to the message of the gospel that they had deemed themselves unworthy of eternal life. Paul was truly grieved by the state of Israel, that they were continuing to reject Jesus Christ and His Gospel. He says, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. His expression then is a desire to change places with them. He laments that they are cut off from Christ, that they are accursed from Christ. And he expresses a desire that if he could, he would change places with them. He's using the title here, Christ, which the Greek word means anointed and is the equivalent of the Old Testament Messiah. Paul's lament and his wish for Israel actually parallels that of Moses after Israel had sinned with the golden calf. Moses' words, intercessory words in Exodus chapter 32 and verses 30 to 32. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Moses is likewise expressing that desire to trade places, to take that punishment upon himself. And that's exactly what Paul is giving vent to here in Romans 9, 3. I could wish that myself were accursed. I I could wish that I were the one that was cut off from Christ because of my kinsmen. Now he, he identifies his kinsmen, his kinsmen according to the flesh. He's talking about his kinsmen of Israel. Paul himself has testified in Uh, that he is of the tribe of Benjamin. He is a Jew of the Jew. Uh, He was a Pharisee of the Pharisee and so on. So in terms of his human relationship, he had a shared ancestry with his kinsmen from Abraham. And Paul expresses a solidarity with Israel here that is striking. And especially in light of the fact that he would soon after this be officially charged with his execution execution sought for being against Israel. In other words, being a traitor to his own people. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. He was at great pains to preach the gospel to them. Paul suffered and gave his life in so many ways to preach the gospel to the Jews first, and also to the Greeks. And he was also at great pains for their rejection of that gospel. I guess we could say it bothered Paul quite badly that they did not believe in Jesus Christ, their Messiah. He continues in verse 4, 
speaking of his brethren, his kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So Paul begins here, and over these next couple of verses, he lists many of the privileges that Israel had received. Again, lamenting the fact that they have received all of these things and are accursed from Christ because they have rejected Him. Paul uses the term that's covenantally rich, Israelites. It doesn't refer here to Jews, which was more of a, of a popular national name for the Jews, but he refers to Israelites. That is a term that has covenantal association, referring to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are the descendants of Israel. And then he begins to give these different um, blessings that they have received. I think it's important here to notice that Paul's not here speaking of Jew, Jews in relations to Gentiles. In other words, he is focusing on the unbelieving Israel. That's who Paul's focusing on. And he is speaking specifically of the blessed privileges that were given to Israel in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. So he says to them pertains the adoption, referring to not the adoption of, of children as he spoke about in chapter number 8, but referring to the choosing of Israel as a nation. The fact that God picked them out and made them a nation when they were not a nation. To them belonged the glory, the glory that is God's presence that was with them as a people that was responsible for the victories that they did experience over their various enemies. The glory that resided in the tabernacle and later in the temple and of course ultimately departed from them. Paul speaks of the covenants and he speaks in plural here and he would include all of those various promises made to Israel. And to the law in particular, that old covenant law that was given to Israel after the exodus from Egypt. He mentions the service of God, which refers to the worship of God. It's the, the sacrificial system that was given to them in the tabernacle and later in the temple. All of those sacrifices that pointed to the Messiah as God's one sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews talked about how that year after year a remembrance was made of sins year after year and should have been pointing them on to one perfect, complete, and final, full sacrifice of God's Lamb. Promises he speaks of, and most likely this points to the patriarchs as that is what follows in the next verse. Verse number 5. Whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. The list continues with the fathers. This is a reference to the patriarchs of Israel, referring particularly to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those who gave them descent. Those who gave them inheritance of promises. As God renewed His covenant with each of them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to them and to their seed after them. And part of that promise of the fathers was the Messiah to come. The Messiah to come of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. And of course, Paul finishes with this statement, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who, speaking of Christ, is over all God blessed forever. Amen. The statement of Christ as God. This is God in the flesh. Come to Israel. He associates Him with the divine right of reign. His sovereign supremacy that He is over all. And He ends this confession with Amen. A word that means so be it. And of course signaling the end of His opening here.
Now obviously these verses raise questions about Israel and about these blessings and, and various things. And that's their intended purpose. Paul is setting up this section. And he's going to speak to these issues of Israel extensively as this chapter unfolds. But he has at the, at the very beginning introduced it with the confession of his own heart for Israel and his grief over the fact that they have rejected and continue rejecting their Messiah. All right, we will stop here and we will close with a hymn.